Okay. Welcome to a special home edition of Prep Sports Network. I'm Brian Stanley joining you today. Uh, and joining me as well is head coach of Mission Prep Football, uh, David Schuster. Coach, uh, pleasure having you on on this special home edition for uh, Prep Sports Network's YouTube channel and uh, secretly piggybacked onto the BS Perspective podcast, uh, my personal project, uh, Don't Tell Chris Sylvester. Uh, coach, how are you today? I'm doing very good. I'm very happy to be here and, uh, you know, very excited to do this. So this season, um, we've uh, our partnership between Prep Sports Network and Mission Prep has grown drastically. Uh, two and a half years ago, we started out with basketball and, and broadcasting ho men's hoops with Terrence Harris. And we've moved on doing audio for a couple seasons. Last year, we incorporated football into our audio program. And this season, we've taken a leap and jumped into the video realm uh, onto YouTube with live video broadcasting. Uh, how has that partnership worked out for Mission Prep on your end? Man, you know, I can't begin to tell you how thankful I am and how appreciative I am of, of number one, you, your work and, and, um, um, and, and Charles and, uh, and Chris um, and, uh, oh my gosh. Steven. Steven. Oh, man. I, He's gonna kill me. It's Don't okay. Me, it's okay. I see him every week, you know. Um, I'm sorry, there's, there's there's so much going on right now. Um, I apologize. No, it, the work you guys have been putting in, and then also uh, at Lorenzo Reina as well, kind of uh, chipping in for those those couple weeks there. Yes. Um, you know, it, it. I've been fully appreciative. It's kind of been a little bit of a, a learning process for me, seeing you guys and, and all the work that you guys are doing and, and how much is going into it. So I, you know, I just, I hope you guys understand how, how appreciative uh, we are at Mission Prep for the work you guys are doing. It's been awesome. There've been so many community members who are just, they, they're, they're raving about it. It's getting better and better every week. You guys are expanding it every week and, and family members are able to sit there and just go, Hey, I couldn't make it, but man, this was just a great experience. I still got to see my kid or my grandson or whoever, and uh, um, the picture looks great. The audio is fantastic. And, and hopefully the product gets better and better every week. But, you know, uh, that's another subject. So, uh, no, just you, you guys have been awesome. And, uh, and just can't tell you how, how excited Mission Prep is about this partnership and, and uh, hopeful to continue to expand it every year. Yeah, uh, I will say that it has been a learning curve. Uh, luckily, I took a couple of television production classes uh, both sides of the realm, uh, live television production, and then uh, a scripted television show with a three camera setup where I had to direct the entire program and do camera switches and, and graphics. So uh, luckily at University of San Jose State uh, prepared me just enough to execute this. I never thought I'd be working in, in sports television, but uh, it has led me here. And, and I'm having a blast working with the video. We've We've gone from a one camera setup all the way to a three camera setup in four games. Yeah, and, and we're absolutely loving it on our end. So we're, we're happy to be with you. And speaking of the product, uh, team's currently setting two and two. You've had some ups and downs. Uh, started out real hot with a new quarterback, uh, Colby White. Uh, first game, uh, unable to get the passing game going. But the second game, he erupted quite well against Napomo. Uh, or excuse me, a Tascadero. Uh, talk about uh, the introduction of Kobe White into the offense and, and the ups and downs that your uh, your team has experienced with um, one spring break happening in the middle of your season, and, and then uh, having a, a lead, the leadership retreat on campus taking away uh, a two key leaders in week three. Yeah, uh, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. I, I, I'll just, you know, starting with Colby, um, we we really feel like this is a, a very special young man. Um, and a lot of it's coming from what we have seen him do for the last eight or nine months, you know, back when we were doing, you know, individual workouts and then group workouts and kind of ramping all the way up. Colby's commitment, his leadership, his athletic ability, 
he's one of the, he's probably the second or third most athletic kid on the team. And everybody's never really going to get to see that all the time because just of the nature of the nature of the position he plays. Uh, but he can do stuff athletically that is pretty phenomenal. And um, his, his uh, you know, the balls look better every single week, every single week he's throwing. Um, he's got, he's just such a bright kid. Um, <clears throat> and, and so we really feel very much like this is a, a young man who's going to really uh, blossom in a major way in these coming years. We're very excited about him. Um, you know, obviously uh, the PV game, um, you know, we kind of had to rely on him a lot and, uh, and, and we're very proud of the way he played in that game. Um, and then obviously gone for spring break last week, but, you know, we just feel like he's, he's going to be a, a, a big time player for us in, in every way. Kind of piggybacking off that, you know, he's, um, the, the team issues this year, you know, started out very hot, very strong. Um, you know, I think PV kind of caught us off guard if I'm, if I'm being totally honest, um, we weren't, we had no idea what to expect with them. And we're coming off of, you know, we basically had to get ready for a game in two days. And on, all we did, honestly, for those two days was a ton of rehab because that was three games in 11, ga in 11 days, two games in five days. Um, and uh, so we just did a ton of rehab and stretching and, and a little bit of walkthrough for both, both days, just trying to get like, all right, hey, we might see this and then we might see this. And, you know, and so the whole game, we just felt very defensive or uh, very, very reactive. We just, we were constantly like trying to, you know, I mean, we're literally just sitting there scratching things on the sideline. Um, coaches, you know, just trying to communicate and figure out what, what we're seeing and what's going on and, and, and we're getting different looks. And so, which you got to tip your hat to PV, you know, they, they came out ready to go and, and uh, they kind of threw down on us a little bit. Uh, I'm extremely proud of the way our kids responded, that warrior spirit that this team has frankly, I think is what kept it a 13 to six game. You know, they had several fourth down stops on their offense. Um, and, you know, we couldn't really move the ball uh, much on offense that, that, that game for a whole host of reasons. I don't think our offensive line prepared very well for it, uh, for that defensive look we got. We weren't expecting it. And then, uh, you know, running backs didn't do a very good job. They weren't hitting the right holes. They weren't consistent with it. And we just kind of got to a point in the game where we could just tell, like, this is just not working up front and we have no solutions for it that we can really readily get going. So we started having to, you know, hit, the, hit up the passing game a little bit more. And the way Colby and Tyler Garrett responded, I'm just really proud of them for that. Um, you know, the Santa Maria game, um, honestly, we had three goals set out for that game that we had to have in order for us to win. We were missing a, a number of kids, either due to tiny little injuries, a little knickknack thing, you know, little bumps and bruises here, or kids on spring break. And, and a lot of those kids had set up spring break well before we ever got cleared to play football. And so we kind of felt like, hey, you know, you guys made this plan with the assumption we weren't playing. And we kind of told you guys we didn't think we were going to play. And, and so everyone started planning this. So, you know, there's five or six kids gone. And, and a couple other kids missing because of little, you know, you know, uh, major bruises or different things that were going on. So um, we, we knew going into that game, we were, we were shorthanded. We knew we were without pretty much all of our passing threat except Grant Callahan. And uh, so we basically just decided, hey, the only chance we have to win this game is we have to be able to run the football consistently. And we got to make Santa Maria move on defense. And I don't think we were able to successfully do that. We, we were in the first quarter. And then, uh, you know, Santa Maria made some adjustments and we weren't able to kind of get them. We weren't able to get a lot of movement on, on that defense. And, uh, you know, from our defensive standpoint, we had to get a certain number of turnovers. We got none. And then special teams, we had to make a couple of big plays. It, in fact, went the opposite way. We gave up two big plays. And so, you know, it's very, very hard to win when you don't meet any of your goals. I thought that whole game was a very, very physical game tremendous respect for Santa Maria and the way those guys compete. And, uh, and I think both teams really had a lot of respect for each other. And they, you know, they certainly showed it uh, all night. Um, it wasn't a chippy game. It was a very hard fought game and, and it was very physical all the way up to the very end. The way we ended that game um, is the, the biggest takeaway for me. Our recon defense on, you know, made a huge goal line stand just to kind of make a point, but it was a big deal. And it was a big deal for us just kind of, there are no, you know, the moral victory thing. Um, and a lot of people, you know, there are no moral victories. I do think there are. Um, 
if there weren't, then there would be no such thing as momentum. And so um, the way we kind of finished that game, I think, is is what we've really been kind of banking on and, and, and working off of and, and just going, hey, you know what, you know, when we're all doing our job and we're all doing the you know consistent things that we got to do, um, we put ourselves in a great spot. And so it was it was a very hard fought game. Uh, you got to tip your hat to Santa Maria. They made the plays when they had to make them, and we didn't. And um, you know, and I think a lot of the, a lot of the issues that you're seeing with our team right now against PV and Santa Maria are indicators of how young we really are because we have, uh, you know, shoot, we got 30 kids and almost all of them are freshmen and sophomores, and so. You know, yeah. about that Santa Maria game, coach. Um, obviously, that was the return of Samuel Herrera as well in the backfield for them. Um, uh, after that was his first appearance this season. Uh, did you know he was coming back, or did you have an anticipation of his his playing this week, uh, last, last week, or, or was yeah. that unexpected for you? No, we, we had a feeling he was going to play. Um, and, and we, you know, tried our best to game plan for it. You know, I mean, it didn't really change anything schematically. It's just more, he's a, he's a phenomenal athlete and a, and a, and a great kid and a great running back. And so, um, you know, we felt like, uh, the first half, we did a great job of bottling him up and, and making him hit and making him compete. We wanted to see, we wanted to kind of test him a little bit and see like, Hey, was, was he going to be tentative or not? And it seemed like he got more confident as the game went on. Um. You know, and, and at the end of the day, you know, we had a couple big, big, big plays get called back, but we could not consistently run the football. Um, and we couldn't consistently get things going on offense that would have really, you know, frankly, the game plan was, you know, we didn't have a whole lot of kids ready for that game or, or available for that game. So we basically were like, hey, any chance we have of winning is going to start and end with our ability to control the clock and, and run the football. And we couldn't really throw it. We knew it. They knew it. They figured that out about two plays into the game once they saw David Luera uh, at quarterback. And, and no, nothing on David. David's a linebacker, you know. And he did a great job handling the run game. But, um, you know, I, I think just our, our inability to consistently run the football just put a lot of pressure on our, on our defense and just gave Sammy more opportunities to go and, and make plays. And, and that's what he did. And. You know, so you, you, again, everything about that game, you just got to tip your hat to Santa Maria. They were the better team. They competed. Uh, they competed very hard, and we got great respect for them. And uh, and it was a hard lesson for our kids to learn, but I'm very thankful that they learned it. And um, and I'll I'll tell you, our our focus and practice this week has been been pretty awesome. So this is the mission prep. Um, excuse me. This is the mission prep. A uh, prep sports network. That was hard to say. Mission Prep, Prep Sports Network, back to back, a home edition uh, with the head coach David Schuster of the Mission Prep Royals football program. Coach, um, this is a program uh, of late that has got a lot, a lot of looks from college recruiters for football athletes. Uh, three of which are athletes we're not seeing this season on the field that are seniors who are focusing on uh, their transition to the next level. Uh, Asani Berkeley, Carlton Brown, and Mark Rodriguez um, are those three seniors. Yet you're left with one remaining senior. Uh, um, uh, excuse me. <laughs> As you forget a name, I'm forgetting the name oh. too. Uh, <laughs> Caden Cheney, uh, still with the with the uh, the team. Uh, first, let's uh, talk about the recruitment that the increasement in recruitment. Because you got you got a, a, a young man at Wyoming, uh, you have a you have a Brian Kowal at UCLA, uh, and now we have Carlton Brown going to Nevada, Sonny Berkeley to uh, San Jose State, and um, Mark Rodriguez to I'm drawing still, a blank on the university. Uh, he's still making a decision on it. He hasn't okay, okay, what's the recruit? What's where has he been recruited to? Uh, he's had a, a number of NAIs and D3s reach out and talk with him. Okay. Um, you know, he took a trip out to Dixie State at one point. Um, he got a couple offers, um, none of which were really a great fit for him. And and so I think he's he was trying to figure out um, he, he's he's trying to figure out kind of where uh, um, where he wants to go with all of it, what he wants that to look like, and uh, so. My guess is 
and I, I don't really want to speak for him on this because yeah. he's still got to make decisions on it, but it sounds like he's probably going to take a year at Hancock. And I think a lot of that due out of the fact that he didn't really get much of a senior year by the time, you know, and, and, and all the seniors really need, um, there's something that kind of needs to be said kind of in their defense on this. The week before we got announced that we could go play football, all the indicators leading up to it that week before were that didn't look like anything was going to happen. There was a lot of the same talk, a lot of people kind of chirping like, oh, yeah, we're going to play it, we're going to play it. But that had been around for about two months or so, two or three months. And so we finally got to a point where we're starting to hold up other sports. We're holding up the kids. Kids are kind of just getting, you know, exhausted of being stretched out. And so I kind of proactively made the decision. Um, we we had a big closing ceremony. So we had a whole day of competition and a whole, you know, Owen Maine's out there taking senior pictures. Parents are like, like it was a big, um, big deal that we kind of made this thing. And we, we did our, a, a modified version of our big senior ceremony that we normally do when your when your season's over. And we did that that Friday, the following week, I think that Thursday or whatever, Newsom comes out and announces that it's time to go play. And I think mentally, a lot of kids, seniors in particular, had kind of just mentally moved on and they'd gotten closure and they'd kind of been like, man, now I got to ramp this thing back up. And, and I think a lot of them, well, all of them, except Cheney, just decided, you know what, I, like, I kind of want to start moving in a different direction here, which we understood, we supported. And, and to a large degree, I didn't really fight them on it because I was kind of going, I get where your guys are coming from. It also gives our young guys an opportunity to go compete and get better. And so it kind of was like, I, I guess it works for everybody. Um, and, so, and Mark, Asani, and Carlton were all kind of in that boat. And, and uh, Sonny and Carlton, I think at that point, it was so late in the year. And they just felt like, you know, man, God forbid Carlton takes a shot and gets injured. This is, you know, it's not getting injured in October. You're getting injured in April. And that has major ramifications on, you know, his impact and what, you know, what the summer looks like at Nevada, potentially the fall. Same thing for Sonny. Yeah. So, um, so we, 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 we fully supported them going, Hey, you know, I think I, they train with us every day and they're out there competing and they're, they're doing, they're doing workouts every single day. So, I mean, they're, they're not, they haven't disengaged on anything. They're physically and mentally getting themselves ready for the next level and they want to be around the team, but they just, uh, um, and I think Mark was kind of in the same boat. Mark had kind of started to check out a little bit. He was, he was exhausted. He's just kind of dealing with a lot of stuff. And so I think he's, and he's in the same boat. He's training, he's competing, he's getting, getting himself ready. And I think he's going to um, probably stay at the, at the local level to some degree. So, uh, what does it, what does it say about your program being, shall we say, a young 11 man programming in your tenure mm -hmm. to get these kind of looks from universities from, from the Mountain West and, and even uh, the Pac 12 with? Brian Kowal, what does it what does it say about your program and, and what you're instilling and and how the athletes are responding? Well, you know, um, I, it, it, it's hard. To, I don't know what it says about us other than just to say that it, you know I think it feels like we're doing our jobs. We're you know the kids are are they understand. Um, you know, time management and personal discipline, and they understand what it takes to take care of business in the classroom and, and on the field. Um, and there have been numerous examples of this, and it started really, frankly, with Braden Farr. And once Braden Farr got an offer, a, a major NAI offer, when we were still an eight-man, that kind of opened up a lot of things for a lot of people. And I kind of sensed it was like, hey, once Braden got his an eight-man, it was going to open up the door for, for Dalton Strauss and BK. And that was ultimately going to open up major doors for, for everybody else. So, um, and, uh, and, and, and Dalton and, and BK are just the absolute perfect representations of us, just the way they operate. You know, Wyoming's told me multiple times Dalton's one of their favorite kids because they show the coaching staff shows up at five. He's there at four for his own workout. Uh, four in the morning and then he competes with the team at six and so he does two workouts within three hours of each other and uh, you know it, it's just um, I guess the, and, and it goes and frankly it does, it's not even so much me man Chad Henry had a bunch of kids that were going next level too, starting with Patrick Laird and, and then Bryce Flutterman and 
um, it, you know, uh, uh, Patrick Miller and all kinds of kids that were just, you know, going different places. So I think it's the type of kid that comes out of mission prep um, because there's so much that they have to do. It's a hard, it, it is hard to play football at mission prep because of, we're not changing our academic standards. Uh, they're extremely difficult and, and you got to be able to compete. And the way we the way we train and the way the time commitment that goes into playing football in this program, um, it's a lot. And I think the the positive that comes out of that though is that by the time you're a senior man, you know how to work, you know how to compete, you know how to work with your hands, you know how to get the job done, and you know and you know how to get the job done in crucial moments. And I think that's extremely attractive to a lot of recruiters, and a lot of college coaches can see it and they know the type of kid that we get. And so. <clears throat> um, I think it's just been a, um, a very beneficial deal for everybody. And, and, and hopefully I think it shows that we're creating uncommon men. And, and that's a big goal for us. And, and speaking of seniors and somebody who's good with his hands, let's get, uh, let's talk about Caden Chaney, the senior that's on the roster, the leader uh, within the mix. Um, talk about his performance this season and, and, and what he's brought to the table in, in that leadership role. Caden Chaney, man, uh, my nickname for him last two years has been baddest man on campus. And it kind of started originally as a joke, but it's really turned into very much the truth. Uh, I genuinely believe Chaney is the baddest man on campus. Um, he doesn't quit, man. It, it, the kid is one of the hardest workers I've ever been around. Um, he's been such a phenomenal leader. He's had so many different roles in this program. He's played tight end, he's played receiver, he's played linebacker, he's played O-line, D-line, all kinds of different things. He's really established himself these last two years as a phenomenal offensive and defensive lineman. And for, for many, you know, for a couple of years, he was kind of in the shadow of Matt Ellingen and Antonio Silva and Jake Morley and these, you know, these undersized, really, really tough kids who, just throw down on everybody and people who kind of just don't expect it because they don't look that big when you line up against them and all of a sudden they're in your face faster than you can think. And it's like, and they're just doing that every single play. And, and Caden Chaney is kind of the next one who's, who's really kind of taking that on, except it's really just him by himself. And, and I think our team has benefited so much from Caden Chaney leading it, setting the expectation, holding everybody accountable, and making sure everyone understands like, hey, this is my last game. This, these are my last five, five opportunities to compete. We're going to do it a certain way. And I expect you guys next year to kind of uphold that standard as well. And uh, I, I can't begin to tell you how much I respect this kid, how much I care for him. And uh, I think the world of him, he's, he's just a great kid. So let's talk a little bit about defense. Uh, first two games, absolutely impactful for the defense not allowing scores in the first half, uh, limiting your opponents to uh, single touchdowns in the second half. Uh, that'd be Napomo and Atascadero, a total of 16 points altogether allowed in the first two games. Uh, three players that come to mind for me are the Larrera brothers, Mario and David, and then Connor Lopez being huge impacts uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Uh, talk about how this defense has grown and, and become really a dominant defense to hold your opponents to no more than 16 points in a game. Yep. Yep. I mean, yeah, yeah, even in the two losses, you know, we're losing 16 to seven and, you know, if we're able to run the ball a little bit more that both of those scores might be a little bit different. And, uh, and then, you know, PV game was 13. And um, I, I think, it's kind of what we expected defense was going to be this year. Last year, the 2019 year, we the majority of that def, almost the entire defense was just very, very young, and and competing against um, you know our first year back up in 11, and and you know, Luer is a freshman, R.J. Esman's a freshman, you know you got all these other kids out there who just were kind of undersized and, and compete. You know the Templeton game, you know they're competing as hard as they can. Um, second half, Templeton kind of started wearing them out a little bit. And we just kind of were like, we're going to take our lumps on defense a little bit. But the, the next couple of years, we just feel like we're going to be very, very good. I'm a defensive minded guy. Uh, that's my nature. Um, that's, that's what I coached for, for a long time. It's what I played. And 
So it's extremely important to me. It drove me nuts last year that our defense was not that good. And, uh, and so I, it's just, it's been a, it feels like a return to what we want to do and what we want to be about, which is phenomenal defense, great on special teams and, and being very aggressive and, and very physical on offense. And so the fact that defense is finally getting back to that point, you know, everyone looks at the 2018 championship year and goes, Hey, you know, Kowal had 2000 yards and Carlton Brown and all these other kids. And they don't, they don't realize really what made us so good was that defense shut everybody down. Nobody could score on us including the 11 man games that we played, nobody could score. And, and it just, it, it exhausted people. It put a lot of pressure on people. And we felt very much this year, like defense was going to be that same way. The Luera's have played so, so well. Um, uh, and, and they continue to be um, kind of jack of all trades for us. Their, their mentality, man, they're, they are some of the toughest kids I've ever been around, honestly. And uh, they're just wired a certain way. They don't tolerate, um, you know, poor behavior. They don't tolerate people showing up being late. That it's like, dude, like commit and be here and, and be a part of that. And they have they have enhanced our culture in a huge way. They've become a, a major advocates for us. Um, Connor Lopez, I got to be honest, man. Nobody was really quite sure what we were going to get with Connor because we didn't really know where to play him. We kept, we played him at like five different positions right before the Napomo game. We had our own scrimmage. Connor played five different positions in that scrimmage. And um, there's actually another young man, Jacob Butler, who who was the Mike, who we feel is going to be a big time player for us next year. He broke his hand and, and is unfortunately unable to play and he broke it in the scrimmage. So Connor kind of went in during the scrimmage. And we're all sitting there going like, oh, my goodness, are you kidding me? Like, here we go. And then all of a sudden he comes out of that Napomo game with, 20, with 19 tackles, most of them all by himself. And he's fitting kids up and he's like, like stoning them in the, in, in the gap. And it was just very much like, okay, we got a mic. And uh, and Connor has been just – I can't begin to describe how, how uh, uh, it, it caught everybody off guard and everybody – we knew Connor was going to be good long term, but to be so good so fast and so impactful this early uh, – you know, I mean, shoot, his very first varsity game as a freshman, you know, as against Napomo, who's, you know, historically one of the toughest teams in the air, in the area. And uh, uh, just extremely proud of him. And, and we got some pretty high expectations for him as well. Uh, coming out of the backfield, uh, it seems like your offense has been known for that one, two running back punch, uh, Kowal, Strauss. And it seems this season it's uh, Sue Sink Harrigan, uh, Jack Sue Sink and Drew Harrigan. Uh, for the first time in your coaching tenure, you've had a combination of 150 plus yard game for two running backs plus three touchdowns each. You've had the combination of 150 yards plus each, but not three touchdowns each as well. Uh, talk about these two when they get into the backfield together, how that rotation between the two uh, keeps the defense guessing and, and allows you to pick up yardage because uh, combined, they have uh, almost 700 yards uh, all together. Yep. Um, you know, I've been a part of teams where, um, where we had one dude who just, you know, running for two, close to 3,000 yards. You know, we had a couple of years at Grace where we had a dude who was doing that, Zach Kelredic, and, 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 and other other players that were kind of you know throughout the years as well, um, where there was just you know nobody could tackle this guy, and we were in numerous situations to you know it, it happened at Mission Prep, it happened at Grace Brethren, um, you know Patrick Laird rushes for three thousand and then gets his leg rolled up in in the title game, uh, breaks his foot in the game and that's it, and everything kind of shut down at that point. And then the same thing for us uh, at Grace, we had a year where Zykel was running. Gets, a, gets his ankle rolled up on and, and we're going into the title game and that was it. And man, we struggled to move the ball uh, against St. Margaret's that night. And um, and it was just kind of one of those, it was a little bit of a lesson to me is like, man, you, we always need to have a second or a third option. And any opportunity that we can, that we can use or find where we can um, have, a, have other dudes who can, play different roles on this and not just like one guy who's getting 150 carries a game 
And and there are some games like that where you gotta, you know, we gotta ride the big dog. You know, Cobol had plenty of those games. Dalton Strauss had a couple of those games where you know BK's out and injured. It's like, hey man, Dalton, like it's your night. Let's go. Um, but the fact that there's other options and you can kind of go back and forth, I've just found to be extremely valuable. And and you can also kind of design things personnel wise and play wise um, that really just put the defense in in a major. Um, uh, it, it's not even so much the play. It's just the fact that you've got, it, it, it's a change of pace. And, you know, Kowal runs a ball a certain way and Dalton runs it very differently. And it's the same thing with Susink. Susink is incredibly balanced and is a phenomenal straight line runner. Drew Harrigan is very shifty and very fast. And people have a hard time catching up with him, especially when you've been trying to deal with Susink and all of a sudden Harrigan's going out, you know, it, 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 there's just a lot to comprehend. There's a lot to physically deal with. And it, it gives us a major advantage. And so our goal every year, frankly, is to have 2,000 yard running backs. And instead of one guy get three, we'd rather have two guys get 15. And uh, and it, it just makes us a better team overall too. And uh, I'm gonna move on to a, a more of a, uh, I guess a challenging question per se. Uh, on Twitter, uh, every once in a while, there's been some scuttlebutt, some some water cooler talk, shall we say, that there are a, a, a selection of teams on the Central Coast that should either go to eight man or go back to eight man. One is based on either performance, you know, the arguments either performance or size of roster. Yeah. And obviously, you come in on an undersized roster compared to most schools compared to Santa Maria, Pioneer Valley, uh, schools like that that have uh, a wide plethora of students to pull from to get athletes. What is your thoughts of people who say schools that are competing at 11 men should be competing at eight men? Um, I would say in a lot of cases, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes for stuff like that, that has such major impacts on those types of decisions. You know, the year that mission dropped down to eight man right before I got hired, they, they made that decision before I was hired. There was, there was so much turmoil that went on behind the scenes that nobody really knows about that really kind of made that decision. <clears throat> um, Cabrillo, I have no idea what their situation is. And I, I would say that's an extremely difficult decision to make. And it really has to be, it can't just be, oh, we have low numbers, so now we're going down. There's got to be a lot of other factors involved that make a decision like that. And um, and I can tell you, you know, for mission prep, we are certainly in no position to sit there and go like, okay, yeah, let's, let's, let's make that jump down. All of our games, maybe we have low numbers in, in one game, you know, during a spring season when we had 30 kids come out. Well, we normally have about 50 to 60. So I'm actually extremely encouraged with where we're at because it means our core group and, 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 and on any team, man, you got, you know, not every kid likes football. Every kid likes to be a part of a bigger idea. And, and a, you know, young men in particular love being a part of something bigger than themselves. And they will readily go, hey, I'll play a sport I don't necessarily love just to be a part of something bigger and cooler and awesome. And so when you kind of have the year that we had, when you strip away all that stuff and there's no cheerleaders and there's no band and there's nobody on campus and there's nobody in the stands and you go, yeah, and we're still going to go play football, you're going to lose some kids. And, and then you also add into it and you also have to go play another primary sport. You got, you know, there's a lot of programs in the area that I think are down to 20, 30 kids, just like us. The difference is our core group it makes up more than half of our team. I don't need 120 kids on my team to go compete with everybody in the area. I just need the right 60 and we can compete with almost everybody up here. Maybe not St. Joe's, maybe not, maybe not the major powerhouses, you know, and Lord willing, we get there at some point and I do think we will. But for us to compete and for us to be a, a, a team that can, can get the job done on the field the way we want to do it, I just need the right 50 or 60 for us to do it. And, uh, um, and we are consistently getting those kids. Um, 
you know, so I think it, it's common for a lot of other people to sit there and be like, man, how can you compete with 120? It's like, I don't need them. Uh, we, we can compete and, and, and do what we got to do with our kids. And um, um, so for where we're at right now, we're at 30 kids on this team. There are a couple of kids that we only have one kid with one major injury. And that's Owen Harrison, who got pulled down in a, in a, in a very, very frustrating way on the sideline and another kid went low and hit his knee. I don't think it was done maliciously. It was just kind of how that play happened. And Owen Harrison tore his ACL, tore his other ACL. And uh, uh, that's the only major injury we've had. We've had a, a number of kids, you know, they've got a, you know, a broken thumb or, you know, a, a major thigh bruise or something like that that's kind of going on. So they're out for a couple of weeks, but in the normal season, they'd be playing in the year, you know, the, you know they'd be playing a couple of weeks later and we'd be rocking and rolling. We'd be just fine. So I'm not discouraged with anything, anything I'm seeing. I'm actually very encouraged because um, I think the health of this team has never been better. I think we're in a position where our kids are physically so strong that we can go into a game against Santa Maria, who's got 60 kids on their sideline. We got 18 suited up and our kids can go both ways all game. And it's a war all game, including that very last drive when they're trying to slam it in. And our kids basically sit, sat there and said, we're stronger than you. Yeah, we're tired, but we're stronger than you. Let's go. And uh, so uh, everything about it is just to say mission prep, it makes zero sense for mission prep to even have a conversation about eight men because uh, I think we've made it abundantly clear we don't belong. And we belong up with everybody else. You know, we compete against Napomo, compete against the Tascadero, and the two games that we lost didn't lose by very much. And, um, and, and our kids are in a position where they're, they're making so much stride physically, the way they've improved in the weight room. Our kids are so strong. Um, we're just extremely proud of where we're at. And, um, and I would, I would advise anybody making comments like that about eight man. It, there's man from personal experience, there's just so much that goes into that conversation that most people don't even realize or even consider and uh it, it's it's not something to be kind of thrown out lightly it really isn't there's it's just uh, you know it's a long answer i get it uh, but there's a lot to it and uh that's what i would say uh my short answer to to that question is uh people that propose those questions to any high school that's playing 11 men whether it's on the central coast california or across the nation just because a team is struggling uh, doesn't mean that they need to, to adjust what level they're playing at. They just need to refocus and find the right leadership to pull them through their funk mm -hmm. and continue to grow. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, it's disrespectful. Uh, let the administration and those involved in the program make the decisions. And we don't need people spreading rumors and gossip and things like that. It just... It's pointless for these kids to be put in the whirlwind of something like that because football at the high school level or any sport at the high school level is about the children or the student athletes playing the sport and not about the spectators who who want to speculate and and cause, you know, cause problems with words they throw out on social media. Yeah, I mean, it, people are going to say what they're going to say. You know, we get criticism yeah. every year for who knows what, you know, I get I get. I get blasted every, you know, every other week for something from somebody. And it, it, honestly, I don't care. <laughs> it's really just more if, if, if there's a serious conversation going on with that, um, I would just advise people to be a little bit more careful about that yeah. one. Cause there's that if you're having a conversation about going from 11 man to eight man, there's usually a lot that goes with that. And it's usually pretty devastating. Um, and, um, but you know, to each their own. Everyone's going to say what right. they're going to say, and and I'll just tell you, man. Mission prep could we could not be more excited about where our program's at, and we are very excited about next year's team. I'm not going to lie, we we can't wait to get going. I'm excited as well, coach. And speaking of excitement, we got one more game left on your schedule this season. Uh, you're going out to the coast to Morro Bay, uh, just past Morro Rock there, and uh, you're going to play the Pirates. Uh, the Sea Pirates, that is, because uh, we have the Land Pirates just to the south of us in San Inez. Mm -hmm. So we got the Sea Pirates. You're playing uh, the, the Morro Bay Pirates there. And let's talk about this last game. What can we expect uh, from the Royals as they uh, meet up with the Pirates? 
Well, you know, we got everybody back from spring break. We got all the little uh, dings and, and all that kind of stuff kind of worked out. So we're going to be close to full, full strength again this week, um, which I think will help a lot. Um, it certainly helped in practice. Um, you know, I think you're going to see a team that has spent a tremendous time refocusing on the fundamentals um, and, and kind of reestablishing our identity a little bit on both sides of the ball. You know, I think we made a couple of mistakes on defense that were uncharacteristic for us. So we've spent some time on and kind of dealing with those. And then same thing on offense. We've really spent a lot of time going, okay, you know, how do we, how do we attack Morro Bay in a way that's successful for us that really sets us up well for next year and is true to our, our, our identity. And so, you know, and, and everyone knows you know, we, we love running the veer, man. We love, we love the triple option stuff. It's been big for us. And so how do we, how do we run our stuff in a way that's going to be, be successful for us and, um, and, and still incorporate the passing game and everything that we want to be about. And so, um, you know, we're excited for this game. There's a, there's definitely a rivalry between, uh, between us and Morro Bay. Um, we, we don't really like them. They don't really like us. Uh, and, and, and there's respect there. But uh, we definitely have uh, we definitely have issues on, on both sides, and, and we can't wait to get after it, compete, and, and see what this looks like. And, and and those games are fun, man. You know, games where there's a little bit like there's a little bit of an edge to them. Uh, they're fun to be a part of, and um, can't wait to compete against them. You know, I think they got they've got some really really good things going on with that defense that they got. There's a couple players that they have that we we feel very much that uh, they could be problems for us, but. Um, uh, you know, hopefully we come out, compete, do what we're supposed to do, play mission prep football and, and uh, demonstrate to everybody um, <clears throat> that we're uncommon men and, and find a way to glorify God throughout the whole process. And coach, uh, one final question for you. A lot of teams are scheduling week six games uh, in the makeup week um, after they've completed their five game schedule and not having to shuffle things around. Uh, will we see mission prep scheduling a week six contest? No, we're done. Um, we're done this week um, for a number of different reasons. Number one, um, we've gotten everything we need out of spring football, man. We competed in two major games with Pioneer Valley and Santa Maria, made our team much better. We had great success against Napomo and Atascadero. They were physical in all four of those games. Um, all of our young kids got a lot of experience, got a lot of reps, and, uh, and we've come out of this relatively, minus Owen Harrison, very injury free. And so there's really no reason for us to kind of go, yeah, let's put next year's team in jeopardy by playing another game and, and getting more kids hurt. But really the more important reason, is, and this was when we, we made this decision right off the bat, as soon as we, you know, it was announced we were going to play, you know, we got 300 kids in the school and baseball can't really get going until they get half of our team <laughs> and they go over and they play baseball. Same thing for basketball. Basketball is missing at least half their team. And so, cause they're all on the football team <clears throat> and we mandate in the football program that everybody plays a second sport and we haven't changed that rule this year. So we've just kind of gotten to a point where it's like, Hey man, football's had, had success. We're starting to kind of hold up everybody else. We only got one field that we play on. And so it's kind of just, it's about that time anyway. And so it, it's a good, it's a good stopping point for us. Hopefully we end it uh, on a good note against Morro Bay and, uh, and we can kind of send our kids out. They can go, go play their other sports, kind of get a break from me. I can get a break from them. They can all kind of take the month off of May and, and reset, regroup, and then we come back in June uh, ready, ready, locked in, and ready to go. And so it just it makes too much sense for us to, to kind of shut it down after this week. Um, you know, there's also the reconditioning of helmets and, and, and gear and all that stuff that has to get done. We got to get it done right away so we can get it back in time. So a whole host of different reasons that just make too much sense. And, and, and for us to go play somebody else right now, it just, <clears throat> I don't see the value outweighing us uh, just shutting it down at this point. So uh, I'm going to sneak one more question in on you. In Absolutely. the Central Coast Athletic Association, the two league tier system this year, uh, you're in the Ocean League. Uh, and then obviously the other side is the Mountain League. Who do you feel is the top dog between the two leagues right now? Um, which team that is on the Central Coast? Who is the hottest program outside of Mission Prep? Because we know Mission Prep is the hottest thing on town uh, in in San Luis Obispo. But uh, who is the uh, who do you think is the hottest program right now on the Central Coast that 
is the one to be knocked off the mountain per se? I would say we're probably going to find out this week between St. Joe's and Rigetti. Um, I, I think uh, nobody's really been able to compete with St. Joe's. Um, he's got a lot going on. You know, they, they got a phenomenal program. I got great respect for him. Um, and, uh, and he definitely knows what he's doing as a coach. And I would say the same thing for, for Tony at Rigetti. Um, <clears throat> he knows what he's doing. His kids play very hard. Um, you know, watched a little bit of film on both and, and deeply, deeply impressed with what I'm seeing. And, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find anybody that could really compete with either one of them. I would also say Templeton, um, I just, I guess, deserving a shot. I, I'm, I'm really, really impressed with, and have been impressed for, you know, for a long time with just the way Don Crow runs his program. I, I think very highly of him as a coach and, uh, and the way those kids get after it, um, He's got a great thing going on, and and you know they're in a tough spot against St. Joe's a little bit too. But um, you know, certainly you remove Rigetti and St. Joe's, I'd say Templeton's probably that third team, and uh, tough to beat anybody after that. So heard it straight from the mouth of David Schuster, head coach of the Mission Prep Royals. The matchup of the week outside Mission Prep Morrow Bay is going to be a Royal. Uh, sorry, not a Royal Grande, Rigetti, St. Joseph. Uh, this has been the home edition of Prep Sports Network Mission Prep uh, with he head coach David Schuster. Coach, I appreciate you joining us for this home edition. Uh, Friday night is our tip-off, our kickoff for, for football. Uh, let's confirm uh, that kickoff time. We've seen two scores or two times, yep. 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. Yep. It's, uh, it's 6 p.m. And I think originally uh, when the schedules first came out, we had it at seven and then uh, changed it. And that, that's been confusing everybody. So it, it's at 6 p.m. Uh, Friday night. 6 p.m. on Friday night. And uh, Press Force Network also premieres Thursday night on PSN TV uh, men's basketball with head coach Terrence Harris. Uh, that kicks off at 7 p.m. from Rigetti High School. And then on Friday night, we will be doing somewhat of a simulcast as football will have PSN TV with them live. Uh, basketball will be on radio only broadcasting on Spreaker. Visit prepsportsnetwork.com for all your information. You can follow uh, Prep Sports Network on Twitter, PS, uh, Pre the Prep SN, excuse me, the Prep SN on Twitter. I'm Brian Stanley. You can follow me on Twitter, Stanley on Sports. Coach, how can they follow? Mission Prep Football. Uh, Twitter is uh, at MCP Football and uh, Instagram is Mission Prep FB. There you have it. That will wrap it up for this, and we'll see you Friday night at, at Morro Bay for Mission Prep Football versus the Pirates. Thanks for tuning in.